Surfers around the world live a lifestyle many would describe as chasing stoke, meaning a pursuit of joyful excitement through the practice of surfing. Throughout the long history of the sport, surfers from Hawaii to Senegal have driven themselves to find perfect waves, relaxing beaches, and a community of fellow surfers across barriers of language, nationality, and race. That pursuit was not always easy, however. Surfing's history has been defined throughout its past by segregated beach breaks, exclusive surf clubs, and even the threat of extinction due to its status as what may now be the most popular indigenous sport in the world. The sport of surfing as surfers practice it today derives from the islands of Hawaii, where the sport was essential to pre-Christian religious practices in a similar way that yoga was a critical aspect of religious practices in northern India. Because the act of surfing was a critical aspect of a non-Christian faith, Christian missionaries worked hard to exterminate the practice. Fortunately, several native Hawaiians refused to quit surfing, and a few dedicated surfers managed to export the sport to a world audience. Even then, however, several surfers throughout the 20th century had to deal with segregated beaches that forbid people of color from surfing on the same beaches as their white peers. Even today, surfing's best beaches are often in hard-to-reach locations around the world, where only the wealthiest wave riders can reach and that wealth is frequently tethered to the skin color of the surfer. Even in Hawaii itself, exclusive beaches on resorts limit access to tourists rather than those indigenous to the land on which those resorts exist. While racism has certainly played a critical role in the history of surfing, so too have those individuals and communities who actively worked to advance civil rights, predominantly for native Hawaiians, within the surfing community to create a sport today that gives hope to those in chasing stoke to find liberation, equity, and community through sports. While various forms of riding objects on waves has been around for as long as humans have interacted with water, surfing as practiced today throughout most of the world derives from Hawaii. The exact date of when Hawaiians began practicing surfing is unclear, but Hawaiian chants dating back to at least as far back as 500 years ago tell the stories of surfing exploits to show the sport was a major aspect of Hawaiian culture by the 15th century CE. In 1777, Captain James Cook documented witnessing men and women surfing in what Europeans at the time referred to as the Sandwich Islands. Cook even went so far as to write in his journal after watching one writer, I could not help concluding that this man felt the most supreme pleasure while he was driven on so fast and so smoothly by the sea. Surfing was such an integral aspect of Hawaiian culture by the time of Captain Cook's arrival and later death in Hawaii that there were strict rules for shaping or making boards. Native Hawaiians at the time used wood from only three types of trees, the willy willy, the ula, or breadfruit, and the koa, and all three types of tree produced surfboards for three different tiers in pre-colonial Hawaiian hierarchy. Even the size of a surfboard was a status symbol. The longest boards went to kahunas, individuals in Hawaiian society considered to be the master of their craft, such as heads of religious orders or master carvers while the middle-length boards went to nobles, and the shortest boards went to commoners. There were even entire ceremonies designed around just the manufacturing of boards, including one involving burying a sacred fish in the roots of a tree cut down to make a surfboard. 
In the 1820s, Calvinist missionaries arrived in Hawaii to find several aspects of Hawaiian culture to be in violation of what they deemed to be Christian values, and that included surfing. Hiram Bigham, the leader of one of the first group of missionaries to Hawaii, went so far as to write, The appearance of destitution, degradation, and barbarism among the chattering and almost naked savages, whose heads and feet and much of their sunburnt skins were bare, was appalling. With the arrival of white settlers and missionaries, Diseases among the European populations followed and crippled native Hawaiian communities. Between 1778 to 1893, the population of the Hawaiian Islands dropped from 300,000 to 100,000, and their culture faced the threat of extinction as well. Forced conversion to Christianity included rules banning the sport of surfing anywhere in Hawaii. Christian missionaries in Hawaii did not only work to exterminate indigenous sports, they also intended to replace them with sports that promoted what they deemed to be Christian values. One of the oldest standing buildings in Hawaii's state capital of Honolulu, still in operation today, is a YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association Gymnasium. The YWCA and its men's equivalent, the YMCA, were and continue to be harbingers of muscular Christianity, which is a movement in sport that uses religion as a means of promoting sports participation and fair play practices. While muscular Christianity helped introduce sports to several communities across the globe in need of access to quality sport facilities, Several Native Hawaiians saw the construction of YWCA and YMCA gyms as another attempt at destroying their own pre-existing cultural practices. At the Oahu YWCA throughout the first half of the 20th century, the gym often promoted European sports like tennis and swimming to working women. While Christian missionaries, either knowingly or unknowingly, were endangering the future of surfing in Hawaii, one dedicated Hawaiian was exporting the sport to the rest of the world. Surf historians around the globe cite Duke Kahonomoku as the most important surfer in the sport's history, and for good reason. The Duke was, as most people called him, a world champion and Olympic swimmer who traveled the world during the 1910s and 1920s with his own quiver, or collection, of surfboards, with the intention of teaching as many people in as many countries as he could how to surf. His visit to Australia in 1915 was so important to creating Australia's surf culture that surfers down under celebrated the 100th anniversary of his visit with a massive 2015 surfing festival in the Duke's honor. The Duke was not only a passionate athlete, but a savvy entrepreneur as well. Not only was Duke perhaps single-handedly responsible for birthing the modern surfing industry, he also became the first person to successfully market the world-famous Aloha shirt. While Duke Kahonomoku was responsible for spreading surfing to a world audience, another world champion swimmer was responsible for using the sport to desegregate that same world. Eddie Eichau was an accomplished swimmer and surfer by the time he became the head lifeguard at one of the most dangerous beaches in the world on the north shore of Oahu. And Aiku's skill at swimming, surfing, and lifesaving earned him the respect of surfers and swimmers across the world, regardless of skin color. That might be why Aiku was the perfect person to tear down segregation in the surfing community. While in South Africa for a surf contest, Aiku was barred from the beach hosting the event because of apartheid politics banning someone of his skin tone from being on the whites-only beach. The experience led Aikau to return to Hawaii with the intent on dismantling the segregation among surfers in his own community.
When turf wars between Australian and Hawaiian surfers in Hawaii was becoming violent, ICAO managed to sit down representatives from both groups and broker a peace that initiated a future of dismantling colonialism and racism in the surfing community in the decades that followed. By the time of Eddie Aikau's untimely death in the late 1970s, surfing was a major industry in the sports community. Not only were surf shops selling equipment on the coast of every ocean on Earth, but competitive surfing was becoming a massive economic industry as well. Surfers were following in the earlier footsteps of Duke Kahanamoku and traveling across the globe in search of undiscovered beach breaks in the pursuit of the perfect wave. There was an economic divide forming, however. The biggest names in competitive surfing during the 1970s and 80s were almost all white athletes. While the sport was not inherently segregated after Aikau's efforts, the wealth inequality that limited what surfers were wealthy enough to travel to competitions in hard-to-reach locations like Oahu's North Shore or West Australia favored wealthy white athletes. Because wealthy white surfers had the money for travel, they disproportionately appeared in surf contests, which led them to getting more sponsorships, which led them to getting more money to appear in more events. And that made things increasingly difficult for Native Hawaiians to gain equal footing in a sport they themselves invented. This was even more difficult for women in surfing, who not only had to grapple with the finances of the competitive aspect of the sport, but also in adhering to beauty standards of competitive women surfers in the community. European American ideals of beauty in the 1970s and 80s led to white women in surfing getting far more opportunities for modeling jobs than women in surfing depended on for financing their competitive surfing careers, something that also led to intense body dysmorphia among women of color in the surfing community who constantly faced standards of beauty that made them feel ashamed of their skin color. Since the 1980s, competitive surfing evolved into the modern World Surf League, the premier league for international competitive surfing, and that league takes representation seriously. In 2017, surf activist Rue Hill stated, We should all take responsibility for making sure that we are not part of any mechanism which directly or indirectly limits people because of some artifact of their birth which they had no control over, be that their gender, sexual orientation, race, or anything else. And the league listened. In response, WSL officials met to design a future for the league in which they could use their platform to decolonize the sport and establish methods for dismantling systems of oppression that held back people of color in surfing for generations. One such program the World Surf League implemented was their Rising Tides initiative. While big name surfers compete around the world on the championship tour, the WSL's most elite level of international competition, surfers meet with local youth surfers to both foster interest in the sport and to increase participation rates among children from communities often denied access to the sport, like rural Indonesia. The program specifically connects elite women surfers with young women and girls in communities that host championship tour events to connect young surfers across boundaries of ethnicity and nationality to role models in the sport. One of those athletes in particular is world champion surfer and native Hawaiian Carissa Moore. Apart from working as an unofficial ambassador for women surfing within the World Surf League's Rising Tides program, Moore also runs a surf camp in Hawaii for young women and girls across barriers of ethnicity and nationality to introduce healthy lifestyle practices and foster community among the surfing community. The Moore Aloha program not only empowers young women and girls to find strength and confidence in themselves, but also emphasizes the importance of compassion and cooperation within the surfing community. 
While figures like Eddie Aikau and Duke Kahanamoku may have prevented the sport of surfing from going extinct, it may be the women of surfing who deliver the sport into the future. When surfing entered the Olympics in 2021 at the rescheduled Tokyo Olympics, Carissa Moore became the first woman to earn Olympic gold for the sport, something Native Hawaiians joyfully celebrated for good reason. Moore was not alone, however. From the previous works of Kahanamoku and Aikau, not to mention the queen of surfing and fellow Native Hawaiian Rel Sun, Moore and Native Hawaiians like her are able to not only practice the sport their people invented, but to use their sport as a tool for decolonization and desegregation in a now global surfing community. This video was made possible by contributions to this channel's Patreon from viewers like you. Thank you.